you for joining today's event. Please stand by for about one minute as we let people join the room and get situated. We hope you enjoy today's presentation. Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining. I'm Kellen Betts, excited to be your host today. I'm a course lead in the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management program. And today we're fortunate to have Dr. Edgar Gutierrez Franco to speak with us. Welcome, Edgar. Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Kellen, for the invitation. Awesome. So for those of you who've attended our events in the past, you know, we like to start things off with a poll. And so let's kick off that first poll, please. Awesome. So first poll, why are you here today? Just trying to get a feel for everyone in the audience. Um, you know, a few of the options I want to learn more about su uh, circular supply chain and circular economy in general. I'm interested in more about research at MIT Center for Transportation Logistics or CTL. I want to know more about connections between circularity, um, supply chain circularity, and sustainability. A few of the options there. And so thank you for, for participating in our quick poll. And while we um, have that poll going, I want to do a couple, couple of quick announcements and an agenda for today. Um, and so first, I know many of you in our, are in our MicroMasters course, Supply Chain Dynamics, SC3X. Hope you're enjoying learning about supply chain um, dynamics and supply chain strategy. For those of you who might be still considering going for the certificate in this course, please note that the deadline for registering for the verified certificate is tomorrow, May 4th. This is not a deadline we can extend, so I would encourage you, all of you to go for a certificate. It opens up more content within the course, gives you access to great assignments and exams. It's also necessary to pursue the MicroMasters credential. Um, you can also get that verified certificate for completing the course. And so again, the deadline for registering for the verified certificate is tomorrow, May 4th. So make sure you do that ASAP if you're considering doing so and you haven't done it already. So with that, for the brief agenda, so we'll have for the next 45 minutes or so, Edgar will introduce the concept of circular supply chains, talk about some of the research in this area that he's involved in here at MIT Center for Transportation Logistics. In the last 15 minutes or so, we'll be saved for your questions. Um, please use that webinar Q&A feature, that Zoom feature there, the button on the bottom, the Q&A. Um, and be sure you're logged in with a name. We will not be reading anonymous questions. Love to see the discussion and introductions in the chat. Um, but again, please use that webinar Q&A so we can keep track of those questions. And so with that, let's check in on the results of that first poll. Awesome, so why are you here today? Looks like most of you or the, the greatest um, share, almost 50% of you wanna learn more about circular um, supply chains and circular economy in general, that's awesome. Edgar will have lots of um, insights to share on that. Um, looks like a lot of you are also interested in the connection between circularity and sustainability. So that's awesome as well. You know, Edgar will have um, lots of insights to share on that. Oh, Edgar, do you have any thoughts on that? Those poll results there. That's great. I love it. I mean, we have a lot of interest in, in the topic, and I see um, people um, that really want to learn today. So I'm very happy for that. Awesome. So with that in mind, let's kick things off. Let's move the poll here. So let's kick things off and let me introduce our speaker today, Edgar. Um, so Dr. Edgar Gutierrez Franco is a postdoctoral researcher and Fulbright scholar here at MIT Center for Transportation Logistics. The focus of his current research is on omnichannel retail distribution strategies, circular supply chains, um, including mathematical models and data-driven solutions, some of which I know he'll be speaking about today. He received his PhD at the University of Central Florida in Industrial Engineering and Management Systems where he focused on last mile decision support systems. So we're very lucky to have Edgar here today to present building supply chain networks in a circular economy, opportunities and analytical models, uh, modeling solutions for sustainable circular supply chains. So with that, please welcome Edgar. And Edgar, please take it away. Thank you very much, Kellen. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this seminar. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to share uh, this with you. All right, so um, let's start. This is a quick agenda for today. 
First, we'll do an introduction of uh, what circular supply chains are, how they are dealing, what is the importance of those. And we'll touch about reverse logistics and closed loop supply chains. Then we will learn how to build circular supply chains and we go over questions. Um, so everything, uh, when we go over supply chains, we always see how everything starts. And everything starts with the sources. So we are here taking resources from the nature. Um, you know, and this has been for the last probably 150 years with all the industrial revolution we are having, um, you know, all the petroleum, all mines. So we take those materials. After we take, we go and we make stuff, we make things, and we are very efficient doing stuff. Um, we make um, all the manufacturing, let's say automotive or plastics or things that we are doing. And after we make, so we use it. And if we use it, so we go over all the disposal. So that we, what we do after use or consumption, we just dispose the material. Um, and that is having uh, some kind of problems because um, we have a lot of those, 82 billion tons around. And the other thing is we also have limited resources. So given that we are doing this, we're very happy extracting all the materials, we are going to scarcity. And that is scarcity and that uh, behavior in our uh, economy are being in a linear consumption. So we always take the raw material, we do manufacturing, we distribute the rest of users, and then we dispose. But unfortunately, there are no limited natural resources. So there is a limitation. Now uh, we know um, probably the last 10, 20 years, uh, we know um, it's a fact. So there are studies that are seen um, that we are deflecting in those uh, materials, in those commodities. So what happened? Let's see what happened in history. So here from the 1900, uh, this is the price for commodities. This is our economic form uh, study. Uh, we'll see how we are very efficient, you know, bringing uh, down prices. But since 2000, prices start rising. So the resources prices rise. And that was uh, a problem, no? Because obviously there is no, no materials, no commodities. The price uh, go up. Uh, because there are more difficult to get it. And obviously here is a problem for different industries. So this is one thing, prices and scarcity. And the third stuff is we have now a lot of waste. And a lot of waste is 2.12 billion tons of waste that uh, we are dumped every year worldwide. There's a lot of uh, waste complexity because we have electronic waste, hazardous chemicals, materials, and one of the ways to solve that problem is through waste management. So we have to do very, very waste management. Uh, how? Adapting logistic systems. And this creates a lot of pressure, pressure in legislation. So we have a lot of laws, different uh, countries, probably in your country, you have different laws than in other country, or maybe uh, you are starting having those. There are others that are more advanced than others, but we have a legislation over that waste there are pressures on the environment. We know that all the uh, movement with um, uh, climate change and all the process that we are living today and maybe is uh, related with this. And obviously the social responsibility. I would take a lot of, of our companies working in social responsibility. All of this obviously create challenges. What are the challenges though? How to keep resources in use for as long as possible? because we are deflecting, we don't have the resources. How to extract the maximum value from the material that while well, is in use? How to recover and re regenerate those products and materials and the end of the, the service life? And the most important, and the one that I love it. And the when we are always with people, show me the money, how we can be profitable. What is the return investment of this? Who can I get? I, I need to keep up with my business. So that is important, and there are their challenges. And all of those challenges are, let's say, handled by the circular economy. So besides those questions that we have, the, the circular economy are looking to have fewer products that we discard, 
to have less material that we extract and to be better with the, in the environment. So we want to maintain the value of those products and materials as long as we can. All right, so there are a lot of opportunities. Circular economy is an opportunity. We know for a fact that the linear consumption is reaching its limits and the circular economy has benefits um, and in the terms of operations, a strategy in the micro and macroeconomic level. So we are talking here around a trillion dollar opportunity with huge potential for innovation, job creation and economic growth. So this is awesome. Many, uh, you know, academia, industry, governments are working on this. We now are in this area. And what do we have? So what is the general idea? So we make our products, we use them, but we have to return those products. And we are here, the MicroMaster of Supply Chain Management. What are the best that we can do in returns? That, that, that piece of returns is one of the most challenging pieces because we need to bring back our products. And that part is difficult after they use. So we have to figure it out how to bring back those products. Let me show you a very quick example. So they say here, we have a jacket and then the jacket at the beginning when it's new, so they have a lot of value, right? So we start using it and in the linear economy, this is the black line. After I use it, I throw it away and then there's no value. But in the yellow, that is the circular economy, I can resell it. Let's say that I start using and using, then here I can do some refurbish over that jacket and then increase the value. I start using again, 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 and after using for a while, I can recycle. And then I come back and they have a new product or the same product, and then you repeat. So you can see this is a very uh, gap in what I can do with circular economy or linear economy. Probably some of you are asking, what are the environmental implications? Because so far we talk about, we don't have the materials, they are deflecting, prices are high, um, we have to collect it, but how about um, the environment? So this one here is another uh, study that we get. Um, we know in production, that is the yellow part, we have a lot of greenhouse gases emissions in this part of the, of the production. So we have here the yarn production and the raw material production. And in this study, we know that recycling plastic uses lower energy compared to the process of making virgin pl plastic from scratch, right? So we are talking about 3x more energy to produce. So there is still a lot of studies and discussion um, what is best, but so far studies and you know people that have been deep in this are saying, okay, yes, it's better to have recycling to reuse materials instead of having from, you know, from the air and using um, from the big. All right. So with all of this, let's see what countries are doing. So we have this one, the European Commission, that we have a new circular economy action plan. This is 2020. So if you are interested, this document is awesome. You can see what all the different plans, Europe. United States, the Environmental Protection Agency, they had a full plan, national recycling strategy. And they have all what we are doing and how they are doing. China, circular economy, understanding a new five-year plan, and they have everything explaining in the development plan for the circular economy. And you can see this is 2021. So this, this is a movement that they are, you know, accelerating in the last 10 years. All right, so with this, Kellen, I think uh, it's a good time to do our second poll. Awesome, thank you, Edgar. We just launched that second poll, so we'd love to have your your thoughts on this um, next question. So what are some of your experiences with waste recycling and similar concepts? Um, some of the options, maybe you're not worried about it and that's okay. Uh, maybe you have experienced too much packaging waste from online shopping, you know, lots of plastic and cardboard you sent to our houses. Um, you know, interesting question I always find is what do you do with your old cell phones? Maybe you stash them like, you, like me, you stash them in a drawer at home, or maybe you have better strategies for those old cell phones. Um, so we'd love to, to have your insights on these on these questions here. Um, so Edgar, I don't know if you want to um, you know, maybe jump into the, your next slide and then we'll pause briefly and then come back to the results while they- Wonderful. The poll. Cool. Perfect. All right, so let's continue. 
Um, so let's see what is the scope of circular uh, circularity in supply chains. Let's see where we bring one of the concepts and how the concepts are, are been building in probably in the last 20 years. Oh, we have here. Okay, this is the results. I'm, I'm seeing the results, Kelly. Yeah, no, awesome, yeah. Um... Thank you everyone for participating in our poll. So it looks like, you know, most of you have the experience with packaging waste from online shopping. That's uh, that's very interesting. I definitely, and certainly you can relate to that for sure. So yeah, Edgar, I don't know if you have any thoughts on- That's awesome, yeah. Or, yeah. I see on the second one is, I take reusable bags with me to grocery. That's awesome, I love it. I, I know most of you are MicroMaster students. Perfect. Um, and the third one, I wish I could reduce the amount of plastic waste, but I know where to start. That is totally true. And that's why we are here. We are um, helping people, helping, you know, the both types, that is the stakeholders, people that produce the waste and people that collect the waste. So that's awesome. Um, okay, and then the uh, fourth one is, what do I do when also comes? I have been a drawer home. Oh yeah, it happens, yeah, it happens. But we'll see after this uh, discussion and if you get involved, uh, probably we'll change the answer. All right. Wonderful, so let's continue. Um, so I was saying, scope of circularity in supply chains. So let's bring some of the uh, concepts. So we have reverse logistics. What reverse logistics um, is, is all the process, all the actions that I take to bring reusable and recyclable products and materials back into the forward supply chain. And that can be in the same or in different industry. So there are processes, so reverse logistics, there are processes, there are tasks, there are full departments in, in different companies that are uh, taking this into account to do all these um, uh, reverse logistics. What is closed loop supply chains? There are some that integrate forward and reverse supply chains. And most of the time they are in the same industry so they can close the loop in my supply chain. And circular supply chains are those that uh, uh, besides the closed loop supply chain and the reverse logistics, they go over open uh, loop flows. What does it mean? They can go to a different product or different industry or to the landfill. Let's, let, let's see this in, in, in some graph. So this is reverse logistics. So I have the forward in black and I have the reverse logistics in blue. So you can see, so they've taken after the customers. So I have to make some process to come back to some of my uh, stores or fulfillment centers, or they have to go to recycling plants. The closed loop supply chain, so they, we are sure that we are in the same industry, doing the same processes, but over the same industry. And circular supply chains are the, the, the same closed loop, but we open to other um, industries, or we can go to another purposes on other products. So here we have a big opportunity, an alternative. We know that a circular supply chain model is an alternative for the traditional linear supply chain that we saw at the beginning. So with that, let me start with resources, with materials. We want to bring back products. We want to bring back those materials and they are divided. Let's see how it's divided in the supply chain. So we have biological or renewable materials. This is one classification. And the other one is technical materials. So in the biological, we have um, you know, the forest, we have water, air, everything that connects to the earth, right? That is very, um, very quick and that we are, can use. Technical materials are like plastic, metal, glass, um, different type of, of um, you know, like a diamond copper. And with these two, we are trying to figure it out how to maintain those as long as possible. Remember that we talked with circular economy and now with the process. So let's start with biological materials, the renewables. So we go over this, we go over the manufacturer, we do all the parts, we have to take them, process them. We will go over the consumer, the consumer. We have to the, somehow take that product and do some kind of collection. And that collection, it can go over biochemical feedstock. So we go over biochemical feedstock and we'll use it again. We they always go to um, biogas, biofuels. We can create biodiesel, bioethanol. And this is how we call in regeneration. 
And obviously we have um, our animals and the, how the air creates um, farming and collection. So that I guess, and they go again and again. So there are biological materials, renewable materials. Now let's see technical materials. There are what we call painted materials. They go over the same process, manufacturer, you know, right? I create my product, I go to the service, over the consumer, and I have to collect it again. And what can I do? I can repair or maintain that products. I can reuse or redistribute. I can refurbish or remanufacture, or I can recycle. So there are the different loops that we have here. And there are different R's that are the famous R's in circular supply chains. All right, so if we take these two and we join them, we have this. This is the Ellen McCartan Foundation um, definition of a circular economy. For some of you that like this topic, I highly recommend Ellen McCartan. They have a lot of examples. Uh, they're working in this the last years. Um, definitely, it is some of the lineage in, in this part. So they join both and it's very colored in terms of renewable and finite materials. All right, with this now we are clear in the network. What is the network and how it works? Uh, we are clear in our materials or products. So we have now the big picture. So what now let's go and let's uh, bring down this to a concept. So if we have the use of those raw materials manufacturing and distribution, and we want to change this, we don't have the disposal. We want to eliminate disposal and have returns. And those returns go over that we just saw, no? Recycle, remanufacture, repay, and reuse. So uh, one of my favorite definitions in circular uh, supply chains, this one is from the circular supply chain network. Also, uh, if you like this, you can um, see this in more detail. This is 2021 definition. Circular supply chains are interconnected systems or supply chains that use secondary and renewable inputs, those that we just saw, to generate value by reducing and maximizing resource use. There are other couple of other uh, definitions. I don't read all of them, but if you are interested, one is by Batista in 2018, and he highlighted the forward and reverse uh, supply chains, where they can join. And then in 2009, Baroque and the other authors, they bring the definition of integration of circular thinking system thinking, I, I know some of you are seeing system dynamics in the MicroMaster. So it's how you bring that system thinking in this process. Again, um, they also talk about business models, um, service to design, you know, life and waste management. All right, so now we know the definition, we have the concepts. Now let's see, uh, what to solve with a circular supply chain? That is where we're talking today. We are learning what are the circular supply chains and how to build them and how to do it. So what, what do we have to solve here? First, we have to create what is the scenarios. We have to monetize waste. So there is no circular supply chain, no circular economy if they are not profitable. So we have to make some profit. That is important. Um, how can I source from local suppliers? Now after COVID, we know the importance of this, how to be more resilient, how to get shorter supply chains, how to I can work with local suppliers because they are also population of our, our materials. What should be my network design? That the people, well, we are here in the supply chain world, we love it, network design. How will be my forward and reverse logistics? How do I create shorter supply chains? And the most important, how can I do collaboration between stakeholders? As you can see, all of those questions that have any industry, government, any organization that is in front of a circular supply chain challenge um, and asking, and they have to answer those questions. And most of them there are supply chain operations and that's where we are here. All right, so let's see now with what tools can we answer these questions? Definitely with analytics. We have to use analytics tools. That is the, that is the way, that is our, uh, our uh, you know, tool belt that we have. Um, let me divide it in three um, different analytics uh, scopes, and then we will see the use cases. So first, we have to be very descriptive. We have to understand what is happening, what did it happen, what is the problem, how many um, uh, sources do I have, what is happening in my industry or in my um, uh, location or what I want to do 
with this. So there's a lot of descriptive analytics. Also, I have to have predictive analytics. Once I know that I want to create my circular supply chain, I have to predict what I'm going to something going to happen, how they will solve it, what are the trends that I have, what could it happen, and what actions uh, can we take. Once we have this, we have the description, we know what is happening, what is it, so we know the prices are up, there is no material, we have to recover, what we'll do. We have to predict where is the material and who I will take it. Uh, what is the frequency of um, customer will do it? I have to do a prescription. I have to choose what is the uh, best action to take. And all of that, it is possible to do it with analytic tools. And between the analytics tools in the world of analytic tools, I make this, uh, let's say this is a big picture. So we have the analytic tools and we have um, in, in some part, the operations research tools that I know most of you I'm, I'm seeing this, and we have also the artificial intelligence, and both are working together. And each of those, they have their own methodologies and techniques. And as I say, this is our tool belt. All right, so now we have the challenge, and we have the tools to solve our challenge. So let's uh, create uh, circular supply chains. So first, I take the reality. I see what I want to do. I want to go over plastic, metal, um, glass, depending on what I want to do, or if this is in the technical materials, or if I go over renewable materials. So I took those, I have to take all that data, analyze that data and create models. What are creating models? Because I need to have a plan. And with that plan, we create the scenarios and we can do the predictions. And after we all do all of this, that we learn, that we prove that we use those analytics, I have to go and talk with, uh, you know, with the people because they have to be actionable. That is the people who will execute what I would do. So in a nutshell, what I'm doing here, we are taking this part of um, modeling instead to uh, create just, uh, you know, from scratch and just, uh, um, you know, from the gut, but we are trying to take those analytics to bring uh, to life circular supply chains. So I take in, data and that data becomes an information that information becomes knowledge that knowledge into wisdom and with that wisdom i can take action and with that i can have all my feedback process and create um strategies for circular supply chains so now let's see uh examples what we are doing so let's see one technical material so the most uh, one of the classic Technical materials that I've been working probably in every corner of the world is a scrap metal recycling. So we have here, this is uh, the city. We have around 20 million world waste pickers. That's, uh, that is a lot of people that are families, 20 million probably families that live up, up for this. That is another area uh, that we'll talk maybe in another, in another um, uh, webinar. We'll talk about this in more detail, but we have a lot, we have an industry just we're here, here, we are just in the spread metals. We have a lot of people working in this and they're very important taking those uh, materials, what we have, copper, aluminum, um, you know, structure and metals, all the metals that we have. Then we go over the manufacturing and we put and we create products again to insert those in society. So for some of you that are interested in this, this is um, a public paper that you can go over there, you can read, you can read the details. What do we use here? We use mixed integrated linear programming. Uh, we did it to synchronize all the different flows and to minimize cost and to be very efficient in the collection of that process. All right, so example with technical material. Now let's jump to another example with renewable material. So this is another example here. Uh, we know that we can create biofuels. Uh, that biofuels can create it for different crops. We have coconut, soybean, palm, igorilla, jetrofa. So there are a bunch of different crops that we can, uh, you know, manufacture them and convert those crops in biofuels. Remember that are in the, in the left side, there are renewable materials. So in this project, we take uh, the palm oil production, the bigger palms on the palm oil, they have um, different dimensions and how to analyze it. But here we are, in the 
um, construction of building the uh, biodiesel. And we have the oil extraction. And we know that some of that palm oil can go for human consumption and other for uh, biodiesel. And that project, uh, we did it. We have been working a lot in renewable material and it's as well that is published. So you can uh, see the details here. We use um, at that time, the stochastic optimization model. So for some of you that are seeing stochastic optimization simulations, um, stochastic uh, linear programming as well. So that will uh, probably will um, uh, enjoy very good uh, this uh, project. But we have all the details. And also we very recently used another project with other colleagues in the multi-objective optimization. So as you can see, we can use all those analytical models and create uh, circular and efficient supply chains. All right, so these two, uh, we went over technical materials, renewable materials, there is a bunch of more examples, but let me jump to collaboration. So in collaboration, we have um, key points to recover the material that we just talked, right? We need the collaboration of everyone in our ship. So obviously we have the waste speakers, that's very important, uh, but those waste speakers have to pick something and let it pick from the consumers. If it is the consumer, it's a citizen or it's a company, but they have to do. And then I have to transport all those materials. And I can transport in, you know, if I go and then I pick carton uh, in one vehicle, there's another vehicle and pick uh, glass. There is another vehicle that pick um, plastic. So we see how we can collaborate and it's safe to have all those vehicles and at the same time, we all can see how we can have one, how we can leverage all the networks that we already have and how we can create more volume creating that um, um, collection and um, um, you know trying to increase the amount of material that we can collect. So this is a true um, collection. So this is one of the uh, projects that we are working on here at the center. So how to achieve those circular goals? Um, so we are having this. Let's see that we have um, a virgin uh, plastic bottle, right? And the plastic bottle, it comes from virgin plastics, right? Here in the, here in the company, I take the a bottle to, uh, you know, it can be from the market store, or, uh, you know, uh, I do it by deliveries. And once I have it, I have to figure out how I, return that bottle. So if we return the bottles that can, can come back to any of those places, it can be go to the um, e-commerce place or to the, the local store, and then have to go back to recycling plants. And with that, we close the loop, we create our circularity. So some benefits, reduce waste, reduce virgin materials, and leverage the e-commerce network. So that is very important, very challenging. So we have to create all those reverse networks. Uh, we need the stakeholders collaboration. We need citizens, we need you to create and believe in this and have to jump this to create better um, uh, supply chains. How we can do it, how we can synchronize all of those operations. And obviously we need to find the cost and benefit allocation and how we do the design to know recyclability. All right, Listen, let me go a little bit deep in collaboration. We can have here connecting CPGs, consumer, 3PLs, and the material circular um, factories and recyclers. So if we here, if we are in this e-commerce marketplace. So imagine that someone um, go to your home and deliver a product. And at the same time, you bring them the plastic. You say, okay, thank you for the product. But give me the, uh, uh, I will give you the, this uh, plastic that I have or glass, whatever. So this is something that we are creating. And there are there is a lot of movement, different parts of the world. We're trying to figure it out because there is a lot of synchronization with the consumer. And once I take this, I can go to, um, you know, I can come back here from the, between the consumer and the e-commerce marketplace. And then it go to the uh, material circular um, plant, or I can create a smart market. If I create a smart MRF, so I will say, all right, maybe if I do um, the allocation of those products, where I have the, will just be located? What will be the flows between them? Maybe I can decrease 
uh, cost and well better. So this is a project that is uh, ongoing and, and we're trying to figure out, we are using those analytics to understand the customer, to understand the flows, to understand the products, to design the network, to see what are the predictions in the volume. There is a lot of analytics that we are doing here and it's something that definitely it is very uh, exciting. Uh, field. All right, so this is all that we are uh, having in our network design. In this last 10 minutes, let me talk a little bit about something that uh, I know every part, maybe every part of the world I'm um, see the omnichannel returns. So we see we, we went over technical materials, renewable materials, network design. Now let's see with omnichannel. So what is happening in omnichannel? So we know that we can buy anytime, anywhere, and in any device, right? We are saying this, the last 15 uh, years, probably, we are seeing there are people that are buying and buying and buying. So uh, what are the um, uh, statistics? So online retail represents around 15% in USA, 17 in Europe, 27 in China, and LATAM is increasing as well, 5%, and it's around 19, 20 worldwide. And we can see here, we are increasing. This is for 2025. This is an unstoppable force. We will they start this increasing? And that creates a lot of um, you know, challenges, pressures, and, and fun projects in what? Dynamic fulfillment. We have to need optimal fulfillments. We need to do all the deliveries. And maybe you're asking, and how this uh, is connecting with circular supply chains? Well, we are creating, or we should have to create those networks and at the same time, having our circularity in mind. Why? Because we have a lot of these uh, retailer and um, deliveries and we are creating all the you know, infrastructure resources doing deliveries, but that creates a great opportunity to manage all the dynamic fulfillment of the optimal fulfillment, our best delivery, and obviously our returns. So we win one of the returns, we have to come back and see everything again. So that is very important um, that we are seeing as well in as a great opportunity to leverage the networks that it came, that is, uh, you know, that for the last 20, 25 years in all omni-channel have been increasing, but it's a great opportunity as well to create better network for circularity. But it creates some uncertainties, right? So the quality of return products, the quantity return it, the product needs return it, and they have obviously barriers, high investment, product restocking, additional transportation costs, all the things with communication, lack of integration. So we have to figure it out how to do it. So there is a, a great, um, I love this at work when um, our director, she was working with other people and see how to create um, better networks and to join all the forward and the reverse logistics. Why? Because we can buy anywhere and also return anywhere. So that is the, that is awesome. So if I can have, right, I can get my product anytime, anywhere, any device, we should have um, allowed to do the returns in any device, anywhere, at any time. Working on this, if you are interested in this, it is a, a great um, a, a paper. This this one, we explained uh, what are the different details and really create a mathematical model to create these two. All right, so I know we have a lot of questions. We have uh, five minutes to get our takeaways. Uh, hopefully you have enjoyed as much as I do it. So with this, let's see our takeaways. So first, we are creating decision support systems to build circular supply chains. So we are aiming to have better tools and decisions to do this possible. Because now we know there is a necessity. There is a necessity around the world. And it touch the people because we see there is a lot of people that uh, their leaves are in this. There are all those waste recyclers, all that people that were in this, that are, we are touching people. We are touching the planet because we are trying to figure out how to reduce the extraction of virgin material and obviously to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. 
and we definitely want to make profit. So we're gonna make profit, so reduce costs and make it good. So these are decision support system to, to do that. So remember, we have the data. The data is in our environment, in our society, in all the behavior for all the organization and in societal industry, all the te technical, economical uh, systems, we have the data. We have the information. We, with that information, if we use our models, we can create knowledge, right? Those analytics that we see, uh, different techniques that we saw over the analytics umbrella. And with that knowledge, definitely, we are going to create that wisdom when we create um, our decisions. And at the end, we have to take action. And with that action, we have to touch all our stakeholders. We have to touch our customers, our drivers, uh, you know, uh, managers in the cities that everyone can, you know, share and participate in this uh, type of supply chain. But with that, that we are doing, that is uh, the thing that we're doing, that is uh, something that uh, we want you also um, can do it or participate in any of those words, meaning any of you are, you know, that is a space for everyone. And with that, we want to create those um, uh, circular supply chains. When we go over um, recycle, remanufacture, repair, or reuse. All right, but um, circularity, we know it's a journey um, and this journey we have here, uh, value for stakeholders, all the stakeholders, internal and external. Um, and we have um, the business requirements and we have the customer requirements. So that's important. So we, the, we are creating value. Uh, we have different levels of adoption. So far, we are seeing that the majority of organizations and governments around the world they are here in real, they recognize. Some other companies, there's a lot of examples that I would say, um, there are don't more, there are more in recognizing, they initiate it, they have pilot and they operationalize. They are here in the transform. And when we have the transform, so we create a lot of value and we have a lot of adoption. So um, that is important. This is what we want, um, we are, uh, working that are, um, you know, awesome examples um, that uh, exist. If you go any of the sources uh, that we uh, share with you today, you can see that. All right, more takeaways in these two minutes. Uh, circular practices impacts the economic performance. They can increase revenue and reduce cost. Uh, the circular supply chain options. So after this webinar, you can say, you know, rethink. We we'll have to rethink this uh, uh, are reuse, repair, refurbish, remanufacturing, and recycling. There is a lot of options. There is a, any of those that is a word by themselves. Key supply chain process in circular uh, supply chains. As uh, we know, and um, here that we are the, the supply chain uh, lovers, we are going working hard in collection and transportation, all the power of sorting and this this disposition and everything with distribution. And we know that circularity strategies allow different supply chains and systems to be interconnected. What do you think? So we have connecting here and we have to do it instead of create that value. So secondary and removable inputs can be used and it will generate value by reducing and maximizing the use of resources. All right, so with all of that, uh, there are these the projects, the concept, um, that is now possible without a team. Uh, this is uh, our team here at CTL. Uh, we're working under the direction of the renowned uh, researcher, Dr. Eva Ponce. We also are working with Dr. Ima Borella and with Kellen. And we have our awesome students that we have, uh, previous students and current students uh, that are making projects, uh, you know, for the capstone, the master thesis, or they are doing projects with their own um, companies where they are working. All right, Kevin. So with that, I want to thank you all. And I think we are ready for questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Edgar. Such a great presentation, such an interesting area and so many different areas to, to go, you know, with this linear economy, this linear structure of our economy. 
is so ingrained in the structure of the current economy. So it's kind of early days for even though recycling is some of these concepts have been around for a long time. It's really kind of early days for some of these topics. So it's an exciting area. I'm also happy to see that um, some of our um, audience out there is finding connections between some of the coursework that they're learning in the MicroMasters program and some of what you presented. And it looks like you might have some um, looking into your papers. And so that's, that's exciting. Cool. So we do have a few questions here in the Q&A that I want to jump to. Um, and again, please you know, use that Q&A feature if you have any questions for Edgar. And we have a bit of time that we can ask. Um, and I'll just kind of start here in order. And again, make sure that you're logged in with a name so that I won't be able to read an anonymous question. Um, I also won't be able to, to bring you on. I see there's a hand raised too. Just make sure to enter the, your question there in the Q&A. Um, so I'll start with a question here with um, by Miguel Vera. It's actually a pretty, pretty challenging question. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, um, Edgar. But so his um, question is kind of about pricing, the pricing mechanism in the economy. And he says that um, recently there's been some challenges with the high price of recycled PET, so recycled plastic um, as an input compared to the virgin plastic input. Um, and so his question is kind of how do companies or how are you seeing companies thinking about this in terms of maybe that trade off between that pricing signal and profitability, maybe or the potential impacts for profitability versus maybe their sustainability goals where they need to increase the amount of recycled content that they're using as inputs. Yeah, that's um, absolutely true. And any, uh, you know, organization that want to go over um, over this kind of projects and create circularity. Um, probably the main driver is uh, how to reduce cost um, and obviously to create product. But as we see, there is, there is not as easy that as it is not a decision that you take from one day to another. Um, you have to use a lot of analytics and in that analytics, you have to identify each step and identifying each step, you can do um, create the cost for each of those uh, steps. So let's say um, in a one minute answer here, but I would love that to, to, to go jump in, in, in front of me. Let's say that we have reusable packaging. Hmm? So with reusable packaging, we have, and we want to replace the, um, you know, the single use plastic with a reusable one. So what I have to do, I have to see how much uh, that reusable packaging costs, and then how we'll bring back the plastic to me and then I have to clean it, inspection it, put it again in the in the um, in, for another customer or for the same customer, um, and to do all the circularity. And with that, also at the same time, I have to compare with the breakpoint with the use of single plastics. So they make sense. They make sense for the environment, right? For the planet. They may say in the profit that I okay instead of I buy all those uh, single plastic, how do will. Uh, put it in my uh, network. Also, uh, I want please in my customers, the old environmentally friendly customers, they want to participate with that. And also I'm um, doing with people, right? I'm interacting with them. So it is, it is challenging, uh, but it is working. And that's why we are uh, very excited with this kind of projects. That's great. Um, great insight. It definitely kind of also ties into the concept of using analytics, you know, because we can use analytics try to identify and evaluate that break even point and those exactly. some of those trade offs and those opportunities with circularity so cool. Um, we have some other couple of quick, 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 excuse me, we have a couple of other quick questions here that I wanted to jump into. Um, and again, please use that Q, webinar Q and a feature we're not able to um, bring you on stage or anything like that in this webinar and so i'll be looking at that Q and a feature. Um, but so this next question is very actually very interesting going into the concepts or the challenges maybe around sorting. Um, this question is by Prabhu Ajaya Balan. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but um, so his question is to enable recycling of plastic material in an efficient way. Um, are there any policies or technologies which are capable of maybe helping with that sorting process um, or you know, helping um, restricting multiple compounds used during manufacturing, maybe upstream as well? So um, you know, technologies or policies, again, kind of around plastic materials and the mixed plastic material system? Great question. I love that question because uh, let me to talk a little bit about uh, the process after we do all the collection because we have a lot of effort trying to figure out how to minimize cost and how to do it efficiently, how to create forecasting in order to collect the material or the products. But once we have the, all the products, um, so we have a different uh, type of those products and we do 
we have to do all the sorting, cleaning, and inspection, all that part. Um, there are technology that, um, for example, can separate depending of the type of material. They can separate, they have, you know, they have the band and they put the products of the materials and um, with automation that can separate different materials. Um, and that create, you know, a lot of efficiencies in terms of how I can get that faster, um, better. Uh, but it's still something that is that people that have been working. I mean, I, if industry probably um, metal is a classic industry they're doing uh, plastic they have uh, with colors or with the type of plastic that you use. Um, there are others that are more difficult. You know, if we are working with chemicals, that can be a little bit more difficult. But definitely that part of sorting, inspection, and cleaning it is a key process, and it is uh, also an opportunity to decrease cost and to be more efficient in terms of um, how they create more valuable products and materials to remanufacture and put it again in the society. Great question. Awesome, yeah, great question. It may ties into the next question I wanted to jump into, but before we do that, um, let's launch this third poll here. We like to kind of close our events on a, on a third poll. Um, so we'd love to have your, your thoughts on this third poll and while you complete that, I'll go into this next question by Deanna Garson. So it kind of ties into what you're, you're mentioning just there previously, um, but her question is more about companies and, and firms and maybe even startups in this space and um, what firms or what companies or startups in this space um, should be we watching, you know, within the circular economy and circular supply chain space. Are there any kind of names or interesting, exciting companies that um, some of our attendees should keep an eye out for? Sure, sure. There is a lot of companies that have been working in, in this. Um, one, let me see, one of the more famous, if we, let me, I'm talking in, in I'm thinking in the result packaging, there's one that the name is Loop, L-O-O-P. So you go there, you will see Loop, and they're having how they are trying to, their, you know, they have a system, totally system, and they how they collect um, um, items from users. Um, like two or three weeks ago, there's another uh, cool example, uh, Timberland, they uh, launched their uh, circular shoe. Uh, that is uh, awesome because they use a lot of, you know, tires and different uh, products that are reusable. Uh, so go watch uh, Timberland. I know uh, Nike also have the reusable uh, uh, shoe. Um, in that in terms of uh, retail. But definitely uh, one thing that we can see across of uh, companies, uh, that there are more examples, there are uh, you know, dozens of examples um, that you can see in detail, for example, in the Ellen McCartan Foundation, it is, um, there is something that is working. There is something that uh, they are having good results in this, but, uh, but it's now something that you can do in a short period of time. That it takes time, it takes, uh, people that have to you know, understand very well what they want to do and how to do it. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you want to see uh, more detailed uh, uh, companies, and um, maybe the Alema Carter Foundation is the best source to do that. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I know they have kind of a, a feature on their website where you can kind of see case studies and examples of companies they've worked with. Um, that's a great, great spot to take a look. Cool, so let's take a look at the results of our third poll here before we jump into our next question. Um, so the poll question was, um, what was the most interesting part of today's session for you? So it looked like the majority, um, half of you said that you're just expanding your knowledge of um, circular supply chains and circular economies. So that's awesome to see. Um, I don't know, Edgar, if you, don't know if you have any thoughts on the poll results here. That's but... awesome. That was the main learning objective, uh, uh, talking in academic uh, terms. So as we're, I'm, I'm very um, you know, happy that you guys uh, expand your knowledge in circular supply chains. Now you know what it is. Now you know the importance of this and you know what are the different stakeholder details, people, families, uh, companies, governments that are working in, in this area. That's awesome. What is the second one? Understanding the impact of circularity in supply chain performance and sustainability. Of course, that is something that we want to do. I want to touch our planet and the environment. And the third maybe is... Uh, Learning about the different concepts in this uh, area, such closed loop supply chains and reverse logistics, of course, and we know how all those are related. And then we have, and the last one, we have 
learning about collection and recycling for plastics and learning more about recycled plastics. So I would say there is a lot of opportunities and things to do. That's great. Yeah, thank you everyone for participating in our poll. We appreciate the, the feedback. Um, so we probably have time for maybe a one or two more questions here. Um, and here's actually a very interesting question that I want to, to bring in here from Elias um, Vetter. I mean, his question is kind of about the concept of ranking the R strategies or ranking those loops. You know, you think about the Ellen MacArthur butterfly model and there's the loops and some of them are small and they kind of expand outward. Um, so the question is, you know, how do, how do researchers or how do companies think about ranking like reusability versus recyclability, um, ranking these different strategies? That's, that's awesome. So I will say, uh, I will start for the last one that uh, that we de desire as a, as a, let's say if I'm a company, if I'm trying to figure out, the last one I do is to do recycling, but at the same time, is the more use it. And why? Because that requires a lot of, uh, you know, work, um, you know, all the recycling process that I have to do, uh, but it's the more efficient as well, because with the recycling, uh, I'm recovering everything uh, as fast as I can, and I mean, creating volume. In terms of, uh, let's say, product, the desirable is that I can reuse it. They can, they can easily reuse for anyone. No, no, they can, you can reuse, um, let's say, as a book in a library. So you have the book, you can read it, and then another person can read it the next day. You don't have to do a lot with the book. You just put it there again. So it, it have that trade-off. Uh, you want to collect a lot if I want to recover the material, uh, definitely. And I think that will be for many more years, we have to go over the recycling and that's why it's very important. And I want to highlight this. And then the, this is, the, the, this is uh, uh, what we can create volume and we want to we want a little circle without the reuse. And obviously uh, we can go over refurbish um, to do all the maintenance that's also um, something that we can do instead of, uh, you know, for example, if I have my, my fridge, so instead of have a new one, maybe I can repair it and so I don't have to buy a new one or create a new one over that. But this is the two streams, a very good question, and it depends of all the trade-off in time, resources, and volume. Great question. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. I know lots of researchers are trying to grapple with those challenges and the different trade-offs between the different strategies. Um, awesome. So I think we have maybe time for one more question, like okay. one minute answer kind of question, um, and maybe tie in a little bit of the concept of our supply chain dynamics course, and we're going to start shifting into like the global supply chain perspective. And so this is a question from Alejandro Barrios. Um, and his question is, you know, how do businesses, companies, you know, there's many multinational companies that are international, you know, so their supply chains are global. Um, so how do, you know, companies think about this on a global perspective? You know, if you think about like a reusable package between a store and a, and a company's warehouse, maybe that's kind of a small scale, but um, how about that global scale? How can, how can companies think about that global scale? Nice, nice question. Um, well, uh, definitely we, we know if we start thinking in terms of resources and the scarcity of resource, we know for sure there are some part of the world that maybe they can have more resources than others. Uh, so with that, there are, you know, as I, as I talked in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the webinar, there is a lot of uh, probably uh, academia and researchers and mostly also governments that are seeing how to relocate resources. So if you relocate resources that is that are global, you can create efficiencies. Uh, and obviously this is a supply chain network design uh, challenge. Uh, it is something that we um, will love to do and definitely that needs uh, a lot of system thinking and all of analytics. Uh, you have to identify where those resources are. You need to identify where is the waste. You need to identify how to transport that waste and how to transport that waste and create value over that waste. So it's a creation between value and waste and where they are located. And uh, that is the supply chain uh, dream. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great, great note to end on. So I want to thank you, Edgar, for your insightful presentation and, and all, answering all these questions. I know we have many more questions we have time for today. Um, we'll be sure to you know, share those with you. 
Um, but such a fa fascinating topic, tremendous opportunities for those who are studying supply chain um, to build more resilient, sustainable supply chains. Um, and so one final reminder for those of you who are in SE3X, tomorrow is the deadline to register for that verified certificate. So please make sure you do so um, if, you're, if you're thinking about doing so. Um, and with that, I wanna thank you again, Edgar, for sharing your time and your knowledge. Um, and thank you everyone for participating in the chat and our polls. Um, and all those great questions in the Q and A, um, and so goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you, everyone. That was awesome. Thank you.